Are there any transgender people in here tonight? No, okay. I'm transgender, and um, I am a bad boy, such a bad boy, actually, that I'm a girl. And um, I'm a bit of a bad girl as well, because I haven't really done much preparation for tonight, so this is your slide. Um, and I'm terrified. And, um, but I thought, actually, rather than hide that, I would uh, kind of own it. And at about one o'clock this afternoon, I was sitting in my bedroom crying my eyes out, thinking, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can stand up on this stage in front of people and talk, actually. And, and I was shaking and I was, I was really, really, I just literally thought I couldn't do it, but how can I let everyone down? I've been booked in, they booked the venue, people have come and all this kind of thing. And I think that some people who are aware of me will be surprised to know that I felt like that today. Uh, I think I'm known for being confident, uh, intelligent, breathtakingly beautiful, and extremely modest. Um, but no, seriously, um, I do enjoy a lot of benefits that not everyone in my situation uh, enjoys. I have a good relationship with my GP. I uh, have a family that supports me on the whole. Um, I have a boyfriend who, who loves me. I've got a, a job. I've got meaning in my life. I've, I've got a lot of blessings. But even for someone like me who outwardly seems to be doing okay, uh, it can still be a struggle, you know, just to go to that corner shop and buy a pint of milk. Uh, so I think that th this is what we're up against, really. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, really, really pleased to be able to come here and share that with you tonight in this suitably glamorous venue. And you all look beautiful as well, by the way. You all look great. Um, that's how you win the crowd, isn't it? And, um, but I've got a friend with me tonight because I didn't, I didn't just want to be miserable. And uh, I like a bit of a natter. So th this, this is a lady who has really actually inspired me this week. And it's, it's very hard, I think, to find people who inspire in the public eye. And uh, anyone who's, who's aware of what I do will know that I'm very much focused on positive engagement and, and, and getting out there. And I don't know what I'm kind of showing here, like, yeah, something. Um, and just, just talking to people, really. And uh, this lady's done that. And she's been in the. Well, shall we play the little clip? Actually, yeah, is that okay? She was gored by a stag on holiday in a freak accident in Scotland and suffered life-threatening injuries. But the newspaper seemed more interested in her gender history. Now, Dr. Kate Stone has extracted corrections from six national newspapers. <laughs> Attacks by stags are very uncommon, but they do happen. In this case, in Bushy Park in London, a man is being chased by a stag during the rutting season. He escaped unhurt, but when Dr Kate Stone was attacked by a stag while on holiday with friends in the Scottish Highlands in December, she wasn't so lucky. The newspaper and website reporting of the incident was widespread, going into the detail of the attack. But several decided to cover the story by including Dr Stone's transgender status in their headlines. She had decided in 2007 to live as a woman and was open about being transgender, but hadn't been prepared to see it splashed over the papers when in fact her transgender status was nothing to do with the story of the stag attack. Dr Stone is a respected Cambridge academic. She's appeared on TED Talks speaking about her company and its interactive printing technology. Yay! <laughs> she noted that the editor's code of practice states clearly... Details of an individual's race, colour, religion, sexual orientation must be avoided unless genuinely relevant to the story. And the Leveson report into press standards was specific about transgender issues. There's a marked tendency in a section of the press to fail to treat members of the transgender and intersex communities with sufficient dignity and respect. Dr Stone's campaign succeeded. The offending newspapers and websites are rewriting their stories. Whether they rethink their approach the next time the issue is raised is another matter. Now, we tried to get the stag, but uh, he was otherwise engaged. But can we please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kate Stone? Okay. 
Thank you. This is a bit left field, isn't it? Hello. Hello. Tell us about this past week, because you've been on Jeremy Vine, you've been on Channel 4 News, you've been in The Observer, you've been on a bit of a media assault. Five months ago, you didn't know if you were going to live or die. Well, you didn't know that you didn't know that you were going to live or die because you were in a coma. So how did you get from there to here? And what's this past week been like? Because this is the culmination of uh, quite a journey for you, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's been absolutely crazy. I mean, I had my first, not only a battle, but my first journey was getting from coming out of a coma and reclaiming everything that it means to be alive. To breathe, eat, drink, sleep, talk, walk, move. Um, I didn't eat or drink for three and a half months. I was fed what I call my vegan pig's will through a tube up my nose, which is my nose back. <laughs> She's vegan and trans. <laughs> That's someone with a lot of issues and is very bitter. <laughs> they could have said vegan attacked by I know, Stagrid. that should be... <laughs> <laughs> But I guess after, after a couple of weeks, when I'd heard that there'd been a little bit of stuff in the press, which is like, well, I wasn't really sure why, um, and that, you know, it's kind of okay or whatever. I looked it up on my phone after a few weeks. I was absolutely just shocked and really, really disappointed because, like, I mean, I've been on my journey of, and I've actually never spoken about being transgender before. I've given a lot of talks. And, and I was the first transgender person to speak at TED um, in Long Beach last year. And I, I don't talk about issues or anything. I just talk about my work, what I do, my company. I don't think we should mention TED here. Oh, sorry. It's not as good as Long <laughs> This is so much better. <laughs> Although my favorite talk last year was at Burning Man in the Desert. That was pretty cool. <laughs> but um, I woke up to see all these headlines. I'd forgotten that I was transgendered because I just got so busy with being immersed and getting on with my life. I too totally busy forgotten. to be trans. Yeah, too busy, too busy. And it's like, you know, there's two things that have kind of shocked me recently. One is finding out that I'm speaking here this afternoon, <laughs> which I had no idea until a few hours ago. And, and reading the papers and finding out I was trans, it's like, like going back in time. So just, just to like put this into context, it's easy to forget what actually happened to you you nearly died. Like, how close are we talking here? Because this antler went right into your neck, didn't it? Yeah, um, literally, a mil I'm told a millimeter from death, um, if you want the gory details. Um, and it was a pitch black night, so it hit me straight on. Um, I didn't see it, it didn't see me, and it ran out of a gate, it was startled. And this antler went through my trachea, passing my, um, my vocal, um, so the, the, the nerves go into my voice box, through my esophagus, and then into my spine. And I'm told it stopped just at my spinal cord. And it didn't get any arteries, did it? No. So a little bit left or right, I would have bled to death. And a little bit deeper, and I would never have walked again. So obviously, this has nothing to do with, with being transgender. No, but that's what people thought. <laughs> what? No, the questions were asked, the headlines the were written. Is the stag transphobic? <laughs> yeah, maybe. exactly. Was yeah. it a, a, a motivated <laughs> attack? So I would imagine that y you could get very angry about something like that. I mean, what, what was your kind of, your kind of response to, to dealing with that? Well, I've learned a lot over the years um, that the best way that you can deal with things is not to get angry. It's to kind of like own the losses. So, you know, something bad's happened. The stag thing happened, the newspaper headlines have happened, understanding, you know, concepts of sunk cost and all of that. And just thinking about, like, okay, what's been done is very, very wrong with the headlines. Because I, I said this week, the stag trampled on my throat, but the press trampled over my privacy. And, but there's nothing I can do about that. So I decided, and I thought about this a lot, that I was going to sacrifice my privacy to try and do something to reduce the chances of this happening to someone again. So um, my strategy and you know, working with a few other people was to get the newspapers to just write a simple statement saying that what they'd done is wrong. Kind of like when your mom says, don't come here saying sorry, I don't care, because sorry means nothing. Write down on a piece of paper what you've done is wrong. 
um, and we'll take it from there. And so working through the press complaints and very calmly and knowing that I wasn't angry, I didn't want any heads on a pike or anything. I just wanted an admission that, come on, this is not right in this day and age. And, and that's what they did. And I tried to let them understand who I am. <laughs> I actually feel sorry for them. And if I could go to each person that wrote that stuff and give them a hug, because they're probably really, really, really embarrassed to be the people that wrote those horrible things. I don't think they, meet, they meant to. They were just part of a system, just kind of doing their jobs. And you know, it's not about getting angry at the individuals. It's about understanding how to kind of like affect change how to kind of like infect change within something, within a newspaper. And if you get angry, you just reinforce a stereotype. So I just kind of like, my weapons are love and kindness, <laughs> which sounds naive, but I just, well, actually, I lured them into my web and they wrote those little statements. <laughs> um, and they didn't know what was coming next because I knew once those statements were written, I wanted that shouted to the four corners of the earth far and wide. And that's what this week's been about. It's been a journey of exposing those, exposing those statements and exposing what's happened. And I think it has actually shifted public opinion. I know from my litmus test of public opinion is sitting in a cab and listening to the cab drivers talk about it. And they've just been regurgitating the things that I've been saying in the media as if it's their own opinion. So. <laughs> I think the, the, the thing for me, I mean, obviously you got in contact with a group that I work with called All About Trans, and I know you said that it sounds naive. Um, I'd like to call it idealistic, uh, actually, but it, obviously it does start off from a position of, of, of thinking that people are inherently good. And it's really hard, I think, to, to believe that sometimes, but um, I have found, actually, that through... And I, and I asked the question at the beginning, you know, do... do does anybody here identify as, as trans? And um, I wasn't shocked when no one really put their hands up because actually when I first started getting into activism and uh, you know going around places, we, we'd do this. And if it was a big meeting, um, maybe at Channel 4 or the PCC or something, you might have one person at the back who'd say, you know, my uncle John is, is now my aunt, Aunt Jemima. And, um, but generally people had never even knownly met a trans person. And I think that what, what you would then do is, is say, okay, so where do you get all of your information about trans people? And it would invariably be uh, newspapers or, or documentaries or, and then you kind of guide them through this and they eventually come to the realization, oh, we get all our information about people like you from people like us. Um, so, we found that actually just meeting people and talking to them has made a difference. And, and you found that, haven't you? Because you, you had the, the editor of The Mirror call yeah, you up. Was yeah. it yesterday after you've been on the Jeremy It was a couple Jeremy of days Vine ago. Um, well, Jeremy Vine was yesterday. Um, um, yesterday was all about smothering the week with, with kindness and love and forgiveness. So that was my strategy. The day before, I was on Radio 5 Live um, the, um, on the breakfast show in the morning. And after that, I got a, um, a message from the editor-in-chief of, of the Daily Mirror. Um, he was a little bit upset and disappointed and, and supportive of what I was doing, but he was a bit upset that some of the newspapers and Channel 4 and people had been make, making it look as though they were the worst. They'd been a bit singled out and the headlines were making them look a bit bad. Thoughts went through my mind were, honey, welcome to my world. <laughs> and I was kind of like writing the headlines about them. Um, and but I could tell that he genuinely tried to make an effort. He said they'd sat down at the time and tried to write the right headlines, which for them was woman gored by stag, woman scientist gored by stag, which is fine. But then at the end of their article, the last four paragraphs, they talk about dates of operations, my children calling me dad, the fact that our neighbors said I had a nasty divorce. I was never actually married, so I don't quite know where that came from. <laughs> but they tried to do the right thing but then they screwed it up. And I could they tell- They printed your previous name as well. Yeah, right? my previous name. Yeah. I mean, how's that relevant? You know? it's, it's not. Yeah. And they tried to justify it by saying that the stag attacked because I was so, so tall. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it, 
it, it was a pitch black night and some of the papers would write things like, her friend said it came out of the darkness and lowered her head, lowered its head and charged towards her. A bit further down it would say, another friend said it was a pitch black night, we couldn't even see our hand in front of our face. Not sure how th both things can be correct. <laughs> So I, I guess I'm interested into how you, you came to this. Have you always had that kind of generosity of spirit? Because I'm really interested in this idea of, you know, treating kind of uh, cruelty or, or, or ignorance with kind of kindness. Um, have your experiences of transition kind of given you a kind of, you know, gen generosity? Yeah, I think I've always had quite a kind spirit and like to see the goodness in people. But in going through the transition, which is horrendous. I mean, everyday abuse, sitting in bars, ice thrown at you from people's drinks, people throwing food at me from their cars. I mean, it's a really, really horrible journey. And where, where's this? In Cambridge. In Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. So that's not what I would think of as a, a rough... No. I, I had ice cubes at you in bars. Yeah. I had the same treatment in Middlesbrough, which is exactly... Is, the places are the same. But how does that um, make you feel is when someone's throwing an ice cube at you and you're sitting in a bar? And you just feel degraded and you feel like nothing but I decided that I would I would I'd rather die there living my life than be at home living and dying and that's what happens to a lot of transgendered people I would put myself in the situation of sitting on my own in any bar or nightclub I wanted in Cambridge and just be myself and just just own that and own that pain even and though you were getting abused yeah because you, you, you have to live your life. You can't hide under a rock. I know that you you mentioned a story about uh, being in a nightclub yeah. once. Can you share that with us? What? Yeah, what so the, well, there was a nightclub where the bouncers were continuously picking on me. And I mean, a long story short, I kind of, I got attacked by someone. The bouncers twisted the story, got the police, had me arrested. Well, they dragged me th across the floor of the nightclub threw me out of the doors onto the street with nothing and, and managed to get me arrested and I spent a night in a, in a cell. But my, my reaction was, was to go back a few weeks later and just, just be there, just, just take it. And they'd pull me off the dance floor again and say, it's not the first time we've thrown you out of here, is it, sir? And, and I'd go back and they'd keep on doing this. So I reported the nightclub to the police and I contacted the owners and told them that I'd done so. And they sent... Um, the HR director and an assistant to come and visit me at work. And they asked me if I'd join them in, in diversity training of their staff. So that they own two nightclubs in Cambridge. So they had 15 bouncers sit in front of me one evening. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I told them three things. I told them I'm a parent and I have children. Meaning... I'm normal, I'm just another person. I told them about my science and that I run a company and that I employ people, meaning I actively contribute to society. And then I told them a little story about what happened in another nightclub in Cambridge where someone, I used to have to wear a wig and someone had pulled it off my head. And their reaction was like, if anyone does that in here, we'll sort them out. Don't worry, you're safe. <laughs> As a, and no knowledge about what they'd done. I'd infected them and changed them from within. And from then on, every time I went, I'd be looked after, I'd be looked out for. Mm, that's really inspiring. It's, it's um, interesting what you were saying about you used to go and sit in bars on your own and people were abusing you because that's, that's what I was really terrified of when I first uh, transitioned. And actually I spent about a good two years, I'd say, as a student in Brighton, pretty much locked inside my, my living room. So I think that we went about it in different ways. You kind of put yourself through that. And um, I think that I kind of locked myself away, but we came to a similar kind of conclusion that, you know, we need to kind of get out there and, and, and fight a, a cruel world with uh, kindness, really. And you're telling me that, we, that our time's up. Can we do some questions and answers? People love to ask questions, I find, when we're talking about transgender issues. Um, what do you think of Conchita winning Eurovision? Do you think that's a step forward? Well, you obviously didn't read my comment is free piece on it. No. Um, I, think, I think it's good, and I think a lot of trans people have been getting angry because they've been saying, oh, you know, 
being a drag queen is not the same as being trans. And it's not, of course it's not, you know, if you just dress up at the weekends. But I know some drag queens and listen, it's not just you put it on and go to work. They love being that character. That is part of their identity for a good, you know, 30, 40% of their life, some of them. And for me, you know, you can get bogged down, but I think that, you know, a lot of, a lot of trans people older trans people are really keen to tell you that, oh, it's not the same as being gay, you know, it's not the same as being gay. And actually, if there isn't a problem with being gay, then it, I, don't really, I don't really care if people think it's the same thing, actually, because it, as far as I'm concerned, it's all just gender difference. And I think people at home looking at that are just saying, oh, that's, that's a tranny, you know, so they probably don't make any distinction between me or Conchita or anyone. So f for me, it's, it's a triumph of just diversity in general. And I mean, why not? You know, if you want to go to the shop, wearing a top hat one day and a, a, a dress the next, that should be okay too, you know, really. And I think that we all need to kind of get over ourselves and realise that other people's gender presentations, it doesn't really matter, you know? So that, that's my take on it, yeah. Hi. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm 50 now, and I've been a bit of a fag hag since I was 14, so I'm totally on your side, right? But sometimes I feel as a feminist that transgender and the way you look is perpetuating the patriarchy's idea of how a woman should look. How do you feel about that? I think that, I mean, I don't speak on behalf of all trans people, obviously, and actually some trans people really don't. You know, I know a lot of people who identify as butch lesbians, don't wear makeup, don't do all of that kind of thing, and actually, I would like to look like somebody who is sexually appealing to heterosexual men, and that is quite a big part of how I choose to dress. Um, but that's kind of me as an individual, really. And I think that if we're going to kind of blame trans people for that, then we need to blame all the other... All uh, yeah, OK, if, Kate, if you've got something bit. to say. Can I answer a little bit as well? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't feel transgendered. I just feel like... Actually, I just feel like a woman who runs a technology business in Cambridge and employs people, gives lots of talks about my work and what I do, and I don't know, I just feel like, I just feel like me. It's like... <laughs> Hi. Hi. Actually, that was the question I wanted to ask. Is there a better word than trans? Because to me, trans feels like, you know, moving from one thing to another. And I'm Kate. Kate, person. <laughs> but how does... How do you feel? I think everybody has to realize it's not about what you are, it's about who you are. And for me, like this journey this week with the press, it's actually not about trans issues. It's about how you can use kindness, mindfulness to infect and make change. I'm not a trans activist. I'm a businesswoman and I, I'm, I'm, this is so new to me. I've never spoken about being trans before. I'm not ashamed of it. It's just irrelevant to me and my life, and I've just learned to get on my life and to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that it's really easy to get bogged down with language, um, but I think actually trans politically, but other than that, what Kate said really, thanks for having us. Thanks. Paris Lees and Dr. Kate Stone, thanks guys so much.